Yes, so I'm an archaeological illustrator, and um, I've been doing a lot of work recently with comics. And comics may seem a somewhat unexpected medium for visualization of archaeological information, interpretation, or data. But over the course of the past six years, I've made extensive use of comics as an outreach and informational medium in archaeology. Producing comics for excavation projects, for visitor centers and museums, comics both for education and documentation, comics as peer-reviewed papers and as conference presentations, and comics covering subjects as diverse as ancient DNA, carbon-14 dating, industrial archaeology, prehistory, and community heritage. In the course of writing and drawing nearly 60 archaeological comics, I have come to realize that they offer archaeology a visualization medium uniquely suited to the requirements of outreach, education, and information, as well as with unique potential to expand the role of narrative visualization in peer-to-peer -peer communication and scholarly discourse. But most importantly, the medium brings an authorial position based within its creative practice that directly addresses some of the underlying issues in the way in which archae archaeological knowledge is shaped and presented. I first started using comics in archaeological visualization when I was working as site illustrator for the Chattel Hyatt project, uh, for the Chattel Hyatt research project. Comics as a visual approach had first been experimented with at Chattel Hyatt by the Science Museum of Minnesota, but myself and two colleagues, Sonia Atale and Berju Tung, expanded on the idea to create Turkish language comics to be used as informational handouts to local village children who were visiting the site on special open days. These comics, with their narrative underpinning and visual context, allowed them to both explain and show not just the archaeology, but the archaeologists and the real-world context of that work. The result was an outreach product, which not only made it very clear what archaeology was by both describing and showing, but who was involved in doing that archaeology. In subsequent projects, I'd further developed this use of the medium in public and community outreach, creating comics which described the practice of archaeological fieldwork, the nature of the data such projects generated, the way in which that data was used and interpreted, and the context of these projects in terms of local history and heritage. These included comics about prehistoric sites on Anglesey for Cadu, comics about the Claudian campaigns in Roman Britain for the Museum of London, which I think count as probably the largest comic I've ever done. It was 10 meters long and three meters high. Comics about the industrial archaeology and labor history of the pottery industry in the Midlands for the Prince's Regeneration Trust. <coughs> Comics about fieldwork projects on the islands of Karakou, <coughs> Grenada, and Mystique in the Caribbean, and the islands of Palau in the Western Pacific. Comics about Iron Age hill forts in the Cludians for Liverpool University's Field Archaeology School, and about the research work of archaeological carbon labs. And this summer, I published a 13-week series of comic strips about local history, archaeology, and heritage in the Oswald Street and Border Advertiser, which is a small newspaper uh, local to where we live, as part of the Heritage Open Days. Um, and some of you may have seen these in the Citations exhibition. Beyond using them for public outreach, through a paper as a comic, in the journal Advances in Archaeological Practice, and now as a forthcoming book, again as a comic, I've explored how the medium can also be used in the context of formal, peer-reviewed communications. All these projects have demonstrated to me, both as an archaeologist and as an illustrator, the flexibility of the medium across a wide range of subject matter and its usefulness in creating accessible and engaging means of communication with not just public, non-specialist audiences, but with professional and peer audiences as well. A comic's ability to show, as well as tell, within a range of presentational fields helps break up complex information and provides context to an audience unfamiliar with its subject matter. Specialist language and abstract concepts can be demystified. Practice and process can be grounded in actual, if not familiar, places and people. Disparate graphic products, maps, plans, artifact illustration, and so on, can be stylistically unified. And by making use of the innately sequential structure of comics, Individual didactic elements can be introduced and explored strategically within a larger narrative framework rather than palimpsested into a single static image. Through these projects, I've learned a lot about the way in which comics are written and drawn, how the means and methods of production both shape the way they look and the way they are used, and what the differences are between comics and other forms of illustration-based archaeological visualization. <coughs> 
Now, I began my career as an archaeological illustrator not in comics, but in traditional fashion, drawing finds, illustrations, architectural reconstructions, and diagrams for publication and archive using, um, uh, in accordance with familiar standards and conventions. And these illustrations uh, serve to demonstrate one of the enduring strengths of scientific <coughs> illustration, an adherence to codified uniformity of production and presentation as an aid to comparative analysis and use an approach which, as they put it dryly in Atkins and Atkins, invariably restricts the freedom of an illustrator. Now, it's a process which invariably restricts the visibility of an illustrator, too. But this isn't really an issue about attribution, but about the nature of the author of an informational visualization. This is about the degree of transparency allowable in productional methodologies in which standardization renders individuality implicit rather than explicit, and authorial voice muted if not entirely absent. In my finds illustrations, once it has been decided to visualize information, to quote Atkins and Atkins again, there is only a limited number of ways of portraying it, and consequently, a limited number of ways of knowing who has portrayed it. By contrast, no one, having seen the way in which I draw comics, could mistake my style for anyone else's. I am visible in my comics through my style. This visibility is an expression of a creative process which actively encourages individuality and of approach and expression across the medium from mainstream superhero comics to independent literary graphic novels. And even at its most conformist, the medium seeks out individuality as a desirable, marketable commodity and recognizes it. Even within informational, educational, and didactic works, individuality is an indivisible and valued component. In addition to enabling the, individuality, uh, the individual visibility of creators, comics enables individuality of focus and content through the use of identifiable characters as a means to anchor storytelling. This has created a culture of visual narrative in which representations of people, their actions, their speech, and their thoughts occupy the center stage of comics. And you can see two examples here. 300 years of experimentation has created a rich vocabulary of person-centered semiotics, speech bubbles, motion lines, iconic representations of emotional states of being, and so on. In comics, people are the means by which a story is told. So just as the medium becomes a manifestation of the agency of an identifiable creator, so the content becomes a manifestation of the agency of an individual narrator. One of the distinctive differences between the visualization of archaeology in my comics and the visualization of archaeology in my non-comics illustrations is, of course, the presence of the archaeologist. The person-centered narrative culture of comics means that people become the natural vehicle for the stories I'm being asked to tell. Whether it is excavation and fieldwork, lab or desk-based research, I can explicitly and visibly use archaeological practitioners themselves to describe their own archaeological practice. In these comics, archaeologists are identifiable agents of archaeology visibly foregrounded as authors of their own data, research, and interpretations. And once agency is moved to the foreground, it is possible to start to pay much more attention to the detail of who is involved in doing what. Undergraduates, postgraduates, lab staff, museum staff, research specialists, and community volunteers can all be visibly, and therefore explicitly, positioned within a comics narrative and their presence visibly, and therefore explicitly, connected with the part that they play in the production of archaeological knowledge. Such an approach can give those who traditionally enjoy little or no visibility within narratives of that process significant authorial presence. Within the context of education and outreach, the depiction of real people performing real science in real places can have a profound impact on the perception of science practice, particularly that of fieldwork. A deliberately real-world approach integrating such person-centered semiotics familiar to comics such as direct speech confounds popular mythologies of archaeological practice as esoteric and exclusive and can help find a place for that practice within host communities. The comic strip series that I did this summer on the history, archaeology, and heritage of the small market town of Oswald Street on the English Welsh border exploited this potential of comics to make visible and explicit connections between the perceived abstractions of heritage and real places, real people, real local history research, and real local archaeological projects. The comic became a way to facilitate the bringing together of disparate community groups, 
and a way to articulate discussion of real-world issues such as development threats to sites and monuments, the teaching of archaeology in schools, the role of heritage in health, well-being, and third aid education, and links between built and green heritage, and so on. <coughs> even, even within peer-to-peer -peer archaeological communication, the close visual associations that comics can make explicit can result in more effective and engaging, and some might even say more interesting, modes of professional discourse, more likely to be meaningful to a pedagogic, non-specialist, or interdisciplinary scholarly audience. And some interesting research has been done to suggest that comics can not only be an effective medium for communicating information, but can also be effective at changing attitudes towards that information. Clearly, a more realistic perception of archaeology can be fostered through a more realistic perception of archaeologists. We are not all tomb raiders, or, how does one say it, obtainers of rare antiquities. We are scientists and field workers with careers, interests, and families, just like anyone else. I'm sure all of us here can claim at least some familiarity with the concept of radiocarbon dating, but unless we have worked in a radiocarbon lab, how many of us actually know what you have to do to extract collagen from an antler? Or how you then turn that collagen into carbon? How much do we actually know of the practice and work of an archaeological carbon lab? Education and outreach are not just for public audiences. They are the bedrock on which are built meaningful and innovative interdisciplinary working. Within the person-centered narrative heritage of comics, focus on agency, agency within research, agency within practice, is an integral part of the graphic and narrative product. And this, this can be used as a vehicle for engagement, information, and even empathy, foregrounding archaeologists as practitioners within the explanation of archaeology humanizes and grounds the representation of unfamiliar practices and concepts for audiences of all kinds. But this explicit visualization of agency does then raise the question of how exactly that agency is best represented. The highly individual nature of comics art and the multiple ways in which even simple visual narrative can be constructed means that there is little in the way of standards uh, or conventions which can be applied to archaeological comics. The field is not large, but even, so, even a brief survey of examples demonstrates the wide variability of approach to both the treatment of content and the execution of visualization. My European-style Lean Claire approach, kind of Tintin does archaeology, uh, the voice that Hannah Sackett gives objects and artifacts, Trent de Boer's DIY zine ethic, Amanda Gomez's freeform sketchbook layouts, and Al Wesolowski's anecdotal approaches, all of these are valid ways of structuring and making comics, but their commonalities are difficult to classify as convention and indeed measure as standards. Such variance in style and content can radically test accepted notions of how to measure accuracy and reliability in the visualization of science. How do we judge whether an archaeological comic is archaeological enough, or, how do we, or indeed enough of a comic? Is it possible that the medium's enthusiasm for visible individuality of authorship might undermine any basis for useful disciplinary application to archaeology? Well, when I worked as an illustrator for the Chattel Hewitt Research Project, there was a long-standing issue with the appropriation of visualizations of the site and its archaeology by those with agendas quite at odds with that of the research project. It was not uncommon to find the same images used to illustrate several sides of a particular argument. This fungibility, what Stephanie Moser has called the recycling of iconic images, becomes possible if the intent of the image's creator can be separated from the image itself. With authorial intent cleaned away, representations are left more open to manipulative reuse. Grace Huxtable's haunting and idiosyncratic images of Neolithic Chattel Hook from James Mellart's 1960s excavations are endlessly recycled, providing evidence for, depending on who is using the image, Neolithic matriarchy, an egalitarian social structure, a mother goddess religion, a bakery quarter, and even alien genetic manipulation. While these images are undeniably the product of a very particular kind of archaeological thought, and undeniably the product of Grace Huxtable and James Mellart, there is almost not enough of Grace Huxtable and James Mellart in them. There is almost not enough visible individuality, enough authorial agency, to protect them from being repurposed and upcycled to fit new archaeological theories and interpretations. But, Imagine how different the visual legacy of Chattel Hill might have been if Mellart and Huxtable had really pushed that agency, that individuality of authorship, 
and had really fully embedded their interpretations, their methodologies themselves, into these images. Imagine if they had visualized Chandler Hook not like this, but like this. Perhaps then these images would not have been just undeniably, but inextricably James Mellart and Grace Huxtable, inseparable from the city of the goddess of Anatolia that Mellart believed he saw at the site, impossible to recycle into an image with iconic status, but very little fixed content. Now this is a confection, of course, but it serves to illustrate how such embedded authorial presence goes beyond mere persistence of attribution. Rather than drawing back from the notion of visible authorship, we should perhaps embrace its potential to create a point of convergence for creator and creation, narrative and narrator, author and voice. Rather than worry about whether a comic is too individual a visualization, we should be looking at what heightened individuality of authorship brings to such visualizations. We see works like this already in comics, in memoir, biography, medical narrative, and even scholarship. Such highly personal, uh, but still rigorously analytical works can never be mistaken for anything other than the voice of their creators at a particular point in their lives and careers. The production of such works is more often than not rooted in craft-based competencies rather than aspirations towards technical or industry standard sophistication, actively embracing an authenticity of form and content and its attendant authorial visibility, rather than hedging it with standards and conventions. What such heightened individuality of authorship offers, I would argue, is an opportunity for archaeologists to become true auteurs, to use the variety of creative expression inherent in comics praxis to become inextricably a part of the process and product of visualization, to become identified with both form and content through metaphorical and literal embodiment within these works, as both creator and narrator, subject and object, story and storyteller. This is visualization as assemblage, a placing of the author into the same context as data, interpretation, and discussion, bringing the author literally into the picture, making the voice of the author literally visible. In archaeological comics, this pushing of authorial visibility can create not just a different kind of archaeological visualization, but a different kind of archaeological narrative and a different kind of archaeological narrator. By acknowledging that stylistic individuality is an essential component of authorial visibility, such works become uniquely transparent and accountable. A redefinition of authorial relationships and responsibilities might help document or otherwise examine aspects of professional practice and personal experience which are otherwise difficult for us to capture. Uh, recording our encounters with, with believers in alien astronauts, for example, or expressing uh, our response to threats to ancient sites and monuments. Or indeed, responding to problematic aspects of the working culture of archaeology itself. Such works go beyond the range of subject matter covered by more obviously informational comics, but they do more than that. They challenge our ideas of what illustration in archaeology should or could do. They challenge the assumption that our approach to authorship and illustration should be governed by a need to create accurate and effective didactic tools rather than expressive accounts of authorial disposition or reaction. Over the past six years, I've learned that comics can, be, uh, can effectively, efficiently, and economically communicate complex archaeological information to disparate audiences by simplifying information without dumbing down, making best use of archaeology's rich and varied visual practice, grounding specialist content and spe humanized specialist authority by establishing meaningful context for representations of the archaeological past and present, and using these things to significantly broaden both the remit and the audience for visualized archaeology. But critically, I've also learned that comics can address the issue of the agency of the visual author. Comics praxis leads creator and creation to become increasingly intertwined and interdependent. And, Lee, and, and rather than this being an impediment to externally defined notions of convention and accuracy, this can become a spur towards greater authorial responsibility. Comics can reposition our, indiv our individuality of voice at the foreground of our graphic product, <coughs> at the foreground of our graphic production, where we can work towards more visible, more transparent, more accountable, potentially more inclusive, more personal, and even more articulate ways of visualizing archaeology. In comics, audiences are confronted with authorship as an intrinsic component of such works, and eventually they come to expect and look for that authorship 
as evidence of authenticity and investment. While in other forms of visualization, the decision to include or not include signifiers to authorship rests with the creator, in comics, such signifiers, which even first-time audiences can readily identify, cannot be excluded. Beyond information, beyond outreach, beyond peer-to-peer -peer or interdisciplinary communication, perhaps this is the USP comics offers us, a medium in which visibility of authorship is not merely an option, but a prerequisite, not merely a choice of approach on the part of the author, but an expectation on the part of the audience. Thank you.